standard or symbol for the tribe of Ephraim was an ox. The image of an ox was displayed on the tribe's banners, and the reason for this was a mystery to me for some time. I was further bewildered after asking a local farmer about the subject. I discovered that I was very ignorant about the different kinds of bovines, as I had to be corrected by him on my terminology when I asked him about the different kinds of cows. Cows, he told me, are females of the domestic cattle. Oxen, I was informed, are adult male bovines that have been castrated. I found that somewhat disturbing at first. Why would Ephraim's symbol be a castrated animal? Castration only seemed to have a negative connotation in my mind at that moment. As I began to prayerfully contemplate the matter, it was not long at all before the answer came to me by way of the Spirit. The revelation of it would bring a remarkable insight into the tribe of Ephraim and how God views us, both our weaknesses and our potential strengths. Let me begin by explaining the difference between a steer, a bull, and an ox. According to the dictionary, a steer is a male bovine that is castrated before sexual maturity, raised expressly for beef. Castration at an early age makes the steer good for meat. It causes them to be more fatty and tender. A steer is nothing more than fodder for humans. Whereas a bull is defined as a male of bovine animal with the sexual organs intact and capable of reproduction. Well, bulls can hardly be trained at all. They have only one thing on their mind, the lust of their flesh. They won't let anything get in the way of satisfying that lust if they can help it. Bulls have been known to plow through a barbed wire fence, oblivious to the damage that they're doing to themselves, in order to get to a female, or in order to fight another bull. They can be very dangerous and unpredictable. Now the dictionary defines an ox as an adult, castrated male bovine used chiefly as a draft animal. An ox begins its life, then, as a potential bull. Being castrated, though, he is no longer fleshly minded. He instead uses his muscle and his great strength to labor for his master. The ox, thus, retains the great strength of a bull, but with his fleshly desires subdued, he becomes more docile and controllable. Oxen can be trained. They will take their master's yoke and perform various kinds of labor, including plowing fields, grinding grain, or pulling wagon. The castration might be compared to the circumcision of the heart, or being born again. There is scriptural precedent to show that this comparison is exactly what the Lord intended with regard to Ephraim. The ox knows his owner, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. Isaiah 1.3 I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus, Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. Jeremiah thirty-one eighteen. To take its ultimate place as one of the twelve tribes in the house of Israel, Ephraim must cease to act as a bull and become like the ox. He must be cut off from his fallen nature and learn to take on the yoke of the Holy Spirit, if he desires to serve God and fulfill his purposes. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5.16 The following are some of the scriptural characteristics of the bull. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, 19-21 
Following that are the scriptural characteristics of the ox. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5:22 through 25 Words and actions that come selfishly from our own flesh, our own self-will, they are as the bull. Those things that are inspired and come to fruition through the Spirit of God are as the ox that will wear the yoke and is easily turned by his master. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. John 3.6 Jeremiah gave a key insight as to how Ephraim must repent. As the following scripture indicates, he must surrender to the Lord and be transformed from a bull to an ox. Turn me, God, and I will be turned. Jeremiah 31, 18. But Ephraim needs the Lord's intervention in order to do this. He must be born again that he may fulfill his spiritual destiny within the house of Israel. Ephraim cannot do this by his own strength alone. Previous attempts to achieve it through self-righteousness, they have all failed. Ephraim must defeat the enemy of pride and learn how to seek God for the help that he needs. God desires our permission for him to interfere in our lives, to bring that growth necessary to make us into new beings. Though This will not happen without trials to be endured. We, as Ephraim, must learn to trust his hand in all things and patiently endure the process of becoming this new creature through whatever experiences he may bring so that over time we can grow and be more like him. Ephraim's prayer should be, I know, Lord, that I have been bullheaded and rebellious, but all my efforts without you, they have utterly failed. Help me to learn how to put your yoke around my neck, that I may be part of your team and work for you. In the Book of Mormon, the Lord describes the nature of the weakness of man and how God can turn these weaknesses into strengths if we're willing to humble ourselves. I give unto men weakness, that they may be humble, and my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. Ether 5.28 Ephraim's great weaknesses are both pride and rebellion. His great bull-like strength can be properly channeled through the humbling that comes with the full recognition of his own weaknesses and his utter failure to become what God has called him to be. Only in humility can Ephraim's weaknesses be made strong and his disobedience transformed into obedience by the power of God. Unfortunately, Ephraim has a long history of rebellion, both in its secular past and its religious past. It is even discernible in the history of the Latter-day Saints. In the early days of the Restoration, there was rebellion. This rebellion was recorded both in church history as well as in the personal journals of the prophet and the diaries of church members. The Lord also shed light on this topic through published revelations to the church. And the rebellious shall be cut off out of the land of Zion and shall be sent away and shall not inherit the land. For verily I say that the rebellious are not of the blood of Ephraim, wherefore they shall be plucked out. RLDS, Doctrine and Covenants, Section 64, 7b. Joseph lovingly labored with the brethren in Zion in response to the rebellions. He even made a special trip over a great distance between Kirtland and Independence to effect a reconciliation. His efforts paid off for a season, but soon there was rebellion again. In Section 83 of the RLDS, Doctrine and Covenants, it says... And your minds in times past have been darkened because of unbelief, and because you have treated lightly the things you have received, which vanity and unbelief hath brought the whole church under condemnation. And this condemnation resteth upon the children of Zion, even all, 
and they shall remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant, even the Book of Mormon and the former commandments, which I have given them, not only to say, but to do according to that which I have written, that they may bring forth fruit, meat for their father's kingdom. Otherwise, there remaineth a scourge and a judgment to be poured out upon the children of Zion. For shall the children of the kingdom pollute my holy land? Verily I say unto you, Nay. Our LDS Doctrine and Covenants, section 83, 8, A through C. The law of consecration for the support of the poor and the other principles involved in the welfare of Zion were rejected by some of the presiding elders in Zion. They refused to comply. This placed them in an opposition, not only to the prophet, but to one of the four principles of Zion. And the Lord called his people Zion because there were no poor among them. Genesis 7:23. This same predilection towards pride and rebellion is found in Ephraim today. We must decide whether we want to be like the bull or do we want to be the ox. The choice is ours. The outcome will determine whether we be a part of the kingdom of God. Behold, the Lord requireth the heart and the willing mind, and the willing and obedient shall eat of the good of the land of Zion in these last days. And the rebellious shall be cut off out of the land of Zion, and shall be sent away, and shall not inherit the land. For verily I say that the rebellious are not of the blood of Ephraim, wherefore they shall be plucked out. Behold, I the Lord have made my church in these last days like unto a judge sitting on a hill or at a high place to judge the nations for it shall come to pass that the inhabitants of Zion shall judge all things pertaining to Zion and liars and hypocrites shall be proved by them and they who are not apostles and prophets shall be known our LDS doctrine and covenants section 64 7 the judgment of God in this regard will begin as follows. And upon my house shall it begin, and from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord. First among those among you, saith the Lord, who have professed to know my name, and have not known me, and have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house, saith the Lord. Our LDS Doctrine and Covenants, section 105, 10, A and B. The prophet Hosea spoke the mind of God when he said, Ephraim is a cake not turned, Hosea 7.8. In the days of the early Hebrews, the fire was at the back of the oven, making it necessary to turn the cake or the bread, or else it would only cook or burn on one side. So what God was essentially saying here is that Ephraim is half-baked. Another way of looking at it would be that we are not fully done yet. God needs to turn us. Is this oven symbolically the furnace of our affliction? Ephraim's pride has suffered a blow these last several decades. We have been greatly humbled by the failures in the church. Is this the work of God? It is my hope and prayer that the saints will not yield to the spirit of disappointment and hopelessness. Don't allow these emotions to become the temptations that take you off the path. Go not after the calls of lo here and lo there. Many self-appointed teachers have sought to delve into the tombs of their sires for tokens of their erring, that by sowing these they might gather unto themselves a harvest from the yield of disappointment and distrust. And in this they have spent their energy rather than in declaring the gospel unto men. God is preparing a faithful remnant that is focused on personal sanctification in a closer, more intimate relationship with him. And Jesus alone is our answer. We need to concern ourselves rather with removing our own sin than pointing the finger at others. Let us come unto the Lord and come into the light and expose the darkness that is within. And however hard the truth is, we must receive it gladly, for the truth will set us free.